Now, we're here at the ECB Forum on, on Central Banking. Every year, it's very clear that Sintra really dominates the attention of investors, but not every year is like this one. Now, for one, it's not, I'm told, quite as windy as it was yesterday, but that, of course, is not what makes this year so special and so unique. We're entering a new chapter for monetary policy, a divergence for almost 15 years of policy experimentation in an age really defined by stubbornly low inflation. Now, this year that has changed. As Claire was saying, our policy panel needs a little introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Jerome Powell is the chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England, Augustin Carstens uh, governed the Bank of Mexico before becoming general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, and of course, our host, the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde. Now, just a reminder, between them, these institutions institutions hold nearly $20 trillion worth of assets on their balance sheet. And they've, of course, maintained ultra-low, even negative interest rates for the better part of a decade with little disruption. They now have the unenviable position of presiding over the great unwinding of policy that may have permanently changed the architecture of global markets. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to have, I'm sure, a robust discussion over the next 90 minutes. Um, Mr. Carson, let me start with you as a central bank of central banks. You know, central banks in general have faced really a succession of crises over the past years, but also some of the structural factors, such as the green transition, digitalization, and increased onshoring. So how different will the future of inflation be from now on? How different will it be from the last decade? Well, I mean, a very, a very important change that has taken place uh, in the last, I would say, two decades, or even more, if, for example, if we compare this period of inflation with the 70s, is that we have much stronger institutional Frame, monetary frameworks and institutional framework for central banks. And I think they're far better positioned to combat inflation. If we go back 70s, and 70s have become a natural reference, uh, we were at the time where, for example, in the Bretton Woods it, it, it was, was failing. Uh, you don't have more, uh, I would say, instability in a system when you are, for example, re revising your exchange rate regimes. And that is not happening today. I think that the period of this inflation there established very, very strong, strong basis to, to create new uh, and more nimble, more agile, better prepared central banks. And I think, for example, the design of the ECB, our host here today, in a way uh, incorporated many of those learnings. So, I mean, when you when when you you are in charge of of combating inflation, what you need to be able to anticipate is that sometimes you will be surprised because there are many elements that affect inflation, and that they are not directly under your control. And I think, to a large extent, this is what we are seeing today. And I th I see a very very strong ability of all central banks to analyze, to incorporate that information, and to react. For me, if you look very careful what is going on right now, in the last two years, we have seen dramatic changes in the environment. We went from having a situation where depression was felt, uh, was, was feared, the deflation was coming to a very quick rebound with the, back, with, the, with the vaccination and so on and so forth, and we moved tremendously quickly from an environment of have, fearing deflation to fearing inflation. And that has been compounded by the Russian crisis. I have to say, monetary policy, as nimble as it can be, cannot respond with that, with that, with that uh, celerity. So I think that the, the, the knowledge of the new form of inflation is being learned and is being responded. So, I'm very positive that this institutional framework and strength of central banks today will take us to the goal where we want to be relatively soon. Chair Powell, do you agree? I mean, when you look at complexity and uncertainty, has it always been this way but we forget about it? Or is this really a new frontier? So, I agree with everything Augustine said about institutional progress. Uh, but I would say, I would add this. We've lived through a period of disinflationary forces around the world. Uh, this is um, globalization, aging demographics, low productivity, technology enabling all of that. <clears throat> and that was 
So we've been in that world where uh, inflation was really not a problem in, in most of the advanced economies most of the time. Since the pandemic, we've been living in a world where, where the economy is being driven by very different forces, and we know that. What we don't know is whether we'll be going back to something that looks more like, or a little bit like, what we had before. We suspect that it'll be kind of a blend, but in the meantime, we, we're, we've had a series of supply shocks. We've had um, you know, very high inflation now across the world, certainly through all the advanced economies, and we're, to Augustine's point, we're, we're learning to deal with it. We, we have, our job is to find price stability and maximum employment, in the case of the Fed, in this new economy with these new forces. And it, it is a very different exercise than the one that we've had for the last 25 years. Nonetheless, the goals are the same. Yeah, so, so I don't know whether, Madame Lagarde, you know, after this volatility, do, do we go back to something that resembles the last 10 years, or is it you know, something else completely? I also agree with most of the points that Augustine made. Um, and, and we don't have to agree between us, because <laughs> we always do. <laughs> but it, I don't think that we're going to go back to that environment of low inflation. And I think that there are forces that have been unleashed as a result of the pandemic, as a result of this massive geopolitical shock that we are facing now, that are going to change the picture and the landscape within which we operate. If I look at our euro area, for instance, um, we have record low unemployment. We have inflation expectations, however uh, unprecise and, and uh, with the pinch of salt that was discussed at the last uh, panel, which was excellent, we have inflation expectations that are um, much, much higher than they were. That's for the internal matters. But if you look at the rest of the world, a lot of the movements that we've experienced in the last 20 years was predicated on globalization, on the breaking down of supply chains, on the uh, reduction of cost, on the just on time. That has changed and will probably change continuously towards a system that we are not certain about at this point in time, which is much debated. Some would argue that globalization will continue in a different format. Some would argue that uh, the place where you manufacture, the place from which you provide services, is going to be determined by different factors than just cost. It will be about cost as usual, but it's also going to be about where do I locate my services, where do I employ people, where do I reduce my cost, and are those areas, geographical as well as political, actually foes or friends? And do I have some predictability about the future of my production or the providing of my services? And the third factor that is going to change the scene from my vantage point is the way in which we produce. And I think that the shift that we're observing in Europe, certainly, towards green transition is also going to change dramatically the way in which we operate. And all those forces are going to produce um, inflation, deflationary, uh, impact that you know, are still to be measured, but in the short run, I have some ideas as to where it's heading. And we'll get back to those ideas shortly. Governor Bailey, do you see this as a sea change for, for the longer term future? Yeah, yes, I do. I mean I, I mean, I think first of all, we have to say that unquestionably, of course, our task is to return to low inflation. But I, I think, and we see this you know, every day, that in, in, in fulfilling that task, we're observing Certainly, you know, what, could, what can turn out to be structural change, and some of it, I think, you know, I would say is already getting there. So I think COVID is le leaving a structural legacy on labor markets and the way they behave, which we're already beginning to see. I, I, I mean, I think, sadly, the European security situation has, has changed. I mean, we hope it obviously doesn't persist, but, you know, it has changed, and that's affecting, as Christine was saying, that's affecting supply chains. Uh, it's affecting the resilience uh, of, of, the, of the whole supply system. And if I'll come, you mentioned um, climate change, change, Francine. I mean, I always say that this is not, because some people sometimes say this is not some sort of dilettante activity by central banks. The, only, the reason that we're not, you know, we're not in the lead on it, clearly, but the reason we have to take it seriously is because it is affecting our world. And actually, it will get worse. I mean, that's a sad fact of life. Um, and we have to, you know, we have to, in a sense, understand that and understand what effects it will have and how we respond to it. So these structural changes you know, are, are very important in our landscape. So, Chair Powell, as these complexities or as these you know, sands are shifting, is slower growth, much slower growth, an inevitable trade-off on trying to deal with inflation? 
I, so I would say that um, if what we see, for example, is the redivision of the world into competing geopolitical and economic camps and a reversal of globalization, that certainly sounds like lower productivity and lower growth. And uh, in many parts of, uh, of this side of that, mm -hmm. you, see, you see aging demographics, so a shrinking workforce, and you see economies that are growing more slowly and, have, and whose workforces are not expanding. So that's, um, that's certainly a possible outcome, and I think probably, to some extent, a likely outcome. And in the shorter term, can the economy, you know, can the U.S. economy actually deal with you know, a possible onslaught of interest rate hikes? So the U.S. economy is actually in, in pretty strong shape. So if you look back a year, um, the U.S. economy grew more than 5.5%. It was really the big reopening year. Mm -hmm. And so we had expected this year to be that, that growth would moderate to a more sustainable path. Um, we also, of course, are, are raising interest rates. And the aim of that is to slow growth down so that supply will have a chance to catch up. We, we hope that, that growth can still remain positive. Um, but if, so if you look at it, it, uh, the strength of the economy, households are in very strong financial shape. They've still got a lot of excess savings from, from you know, forced saving from not being able to travel and things like that, and also from fiscal transfers. So households are overall, not, not every household, uh, and not, not the ones at the lower end of the income spectrum, but overall in strong shape. The same thing is, is true of businesses, very, very low uh, rates of default and things like that, lots of cash on the balance sheet. Um, the labor market is tremendously strong, you know, still averaging very, very high uh, uh, job growth per month. So overall, the U.S. economy is, is, in, uh, is, is well positioned to withstand tighter monetary policy, we think. It, it, but is it automatically a trade-off between fighting inflation or taking care of the economy? And how, how far are you willing to go with interest rate hikes? So I guess I'd say it this way. Our aim is to, is to have growth moderate. It's, it's sort of a necessary adjustment that needs to happen so that, again, supply can catch up. It could be supply of workers. It could be, it could be time for the supply chains to, uh, you know, to improve. So the sense of that is that if we can get, right now, supply and demand are really out of balance in many parts of the U.S. economy, labor market being a big example of that. We need to get them better in balance so that inflation can come down. And that's the aim of what we're doing. Now, we don't have precision tools, obviously. Monetary policy, famously a blunt tool. That is our aim, that is our intention. We think that there are pathways for us to achieve that, to achieve the path back to 2% inflation uh, while still retaining a, sustaining a strong labor market. We believe we can do that, that is our aim. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that we can do that. It's, it's obviously something that's going to be quite challenging and I would also say that the events of the last few months have made it significantly more challenging, thinking there particularly of the war in Ukraine which has you know, added tremendously to infl inflationary pressures around food and energy commodities and, and agricultural chemicals and industrial chemicals and things like that. So it's gotten harder. The pathways have gotten narrower. Nonetheless, that is our aim, and we believe that there are pathways to, to achieve that. Uh, President Lagarde, can, can you talk to us about the, this fine balancing act for Europe and what that means? Well, you know, what I find extraordinary is that sort of 10, 15 minutes into this debate, we haven't really used the word energy. And certainly in this part of the world, uh, the energy shock that we have, uh, we, we have suffered are suffering and probably will continue to suffer, has had a major impact. And I think this is not specific to, to Europe, but there is certainly a dependency of European countries, and the euro area is certainly a point in case, uh, to external supply from foes. Um, and, and that has, has had a major impact on uh, prices. Uh, it is certainly a very driving force, a strong driving force of uh, the inflation that we have experienced in the last few months. This has been, as you said, Jay, exasper exacerbated by, by the war. And I think the proximity of Europe relative to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the war scene has, has had a, probably a more significant impact on the price both of energy and of food, which are clearly very important components uh, to take into account, including in inflation expectations, as, as was discussed earlier. But we also have, you know, from, you know, that, that end is a series of supply shocks that are, that are hitting the European economy. But we also have this um, recovery that is very much underway, uh, that is certainly driven by services uh, because of the, the swing that we've observed from goods to services, and which is uh, also, um, you know, supporting uh, the economy. We have very low unemployment numbers. 
high employment participation. Some of it is more attributable to public service uh, jobs than private sector, although that is also back to pre-pandemic uh, moments. And we have a couple of other items, such as significant savings that, uh, that uh, are still um, to be used, hopefully, um, or not. And, uh, and we have fiscal policy. And the fiscal policy that we are seeing at the moment is roughly in the range of 1% GDP. Uh, but, you know, we, we need to see how fiscal authorities uh, move, where they move, and we certainly hope that they will move in a targeted, temporary mm -hmm. way in order to make sure that they support the most vulnerable and, and not in a, in a broad uh, and discriminated fashion as, as we have unfortunately observed so far. Uh, why do you prefer actually the, the more gradual approach? So yesterday you reiterated 25 basis points Gradual for monetary policy? For monetary policy. Well, don't forget, I didn't say gradual full stop. I said <laughs> gradual but optional. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a combination of the two uh, that actually matters for us. Um, you know, moving gradually is uh, certainly appropriate in times of very high uncertainty, but as the uncertainty will clear in, 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 on various accounts, uh, we will have to so certainly be less gradual and give more way to optionality. But we have both of them in combination at the moment, optionalities uh, being also a very critical uh, aspect of our determination. Uh, Mr. Carson, I mean, you've been pretty vocal, actually, on what central banks should do. Do you think they need to cut faster? Well, I mean, I think every, everyone should react according to uh, their own circumstances. What is very satisfactory at this stage is that pretty much all central banks have a uh, starting address, address the issues. I mean, one way of dealing with this, of it, is, is through words, to recognizing you have a problem, to saying that you will address it, and pretty much all have already entered into the field of action. So central banks have been acting in consequence. Mm -hmm. I have to say the level of interest rates worldwide have adjusted. The level of interest rates, if you look them from the yield curves, they have been increasing quite substantially. What we can say is that global uh, financial conditions have tightened substantially because we don't have to, we, 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 we shouldn't forget that this in a way has become a global phenomena. I mean, inflation around the world has been increasing. Now, each country, as, as, as uh, Christine and uh, Andrew and Jay has been saying, each one face different dynamics of inflation. I mean, in a way, I think what, what, what is very, very important is that in the realm of their, cons of, of, of their own economies, uh, what, what they, they should try to do is, uh, at some point, prevent a full transition from a low inflation a environment to a high inflation environment where this high inflation gets entrenched. And for that, basically, you need to prevent uh, these uh, vicious cycles to kick in. Yeah. And pretty much all of them are addressing it. Uh, in these vicious cycles, uh, labor markets are very important. And labor markets are very different uh, across the world. Uh, therefore, I think that there is no one recipe or no one remedy for all. But what I'm seeing is that pretty much all central banks have been addressing the issue in a forceful, determined way according to their own circumstances. Well, so, Mr. Carson, does it mean that you would be in favor of you know, front-loading hikes so that it's a powerful message maybe to people, you, you know, for, for a, a lot of the citizens? Well, to, let me, to let not me, let me give you a good example <laughs> and to introduce a little bit of a different flavor here. I come from emerging markets, and if you see how emerging markets have been acting this time around compared to other periods of very high interest rate increases in advanced economies or the expectations of fast increases in interest rates, they have acted quite well, you know. I mean, if you see the more recent episode was the temper tantrum where many emerging markets uh, suffer dramatically with the expectation of higher interest rates. My own country, Mexico, several of our crises have been associated with rapid increases in U.S. interest rates. But we have learned our lesson. And so what you see is emerging markets traditionally were the ones who would increase interest, interest rates at the very end. 
Now they started very early on. And what you can see is that they have managed to keep their exchange rates quite stable. Traditionally, in emerging markets, exchange rates was a very important source of inflation. So now they're still facing the sources of inflation from the commodity shocks, uh, from, from energy, from world aggregate demand, but not the ones that, that could have been inflicted by the movement in the exchange rate. So there you see that, that different central banks can act at a different pace. Mm -hmm. For them, it really was critical to act forcefully and very, 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 very early on in the game. But that, that's not the circumstances you see around. So, I mean, I would say that, 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 uh, that uh, each, each, each central bank is playing its, 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 its own game because it's different circumstances. Um, Governor Bailey, does the guidance from the BOE on moving forcefully actually open the door for 50 basis points? Well, I think the way I would frame that it, it very much goes back to what the others have been saying. Is, and as Christine was saying, I mean, we are being hit by a very large national real income shock, which is coming from outside. There is uncertainty around two parts of that in terms of monetary policy. One is, of course, the eventual scale of it, because it's unfortunately still evolving. Secondly, the impact of it, precisely how it passes through into the economy and what the effects of it are. But the scale of the shock is, is very substantial. And in and of itself, it will have an effect, a big effect, because it will reduce domestic demand and it will pass through into the labor market and it will pass through into inflation. Monetary policy has, of course, a very important role to play because, because it, you know, it will act alongside that shock. And it's very important, as we said, and this is where we come to the language that we use, that it, of course, is, it is there also to tackle the second round effects as they come through price setting and, and, and wage setting. So the, the message that we, we gave and was in the language of our last meeting, as you, as you rightly said, was that if we see greater persistence of inflation, that's second round effects, mm -hmm. then we will act more forcefully. Oh, and we will have to act more forcefully. Now, in terms of your precise question, what does that mean? Well, of course, I'm not <laughs> going to say what it means at our next meeting, because you know, our next meeting is still a month away. A lot, a lot will happen between then. What I would say to you is that, of course, it, it leaves options on the table. And that's very deliberate, very deliberate. I mean, if people, I want people to take a message away from that. It's quite clear that as we respond to this shock, uh, we, we want to have those options on the table for precisely the reason that Agustin has just said. Um, you know, there will be circumstances in which we will have to do more. We're not there yet in terms of the next meeting. We're still a month away, but yeah, that's on the table. But you shouldn't assume it's the only thing on the table. That's yeah. the key point. But, Governor, for you personally, would you be leading towards 50 basis points? No, because, because I'm going to see what happens in the next month. No. Um, you know, I, I'm no. afraid one thing, one thing that is omnipresent in our system is that we make, we make policy meeting by meeting. And there's always another meeting. If you can only guarantee one thing in monetary policy, it is that there's another meeting. Yeah. No. <laughs> is, it, is it actually annoying that markets, you know, that markets or reporters always try and, and understand, you know, some of this very personal thinking on interpretation, for example, um, Chair Jay Powell. I mean, I tried my luck with Governor Bailey, but how do we, you know, how, how should we be thinking about this? Like, is it, you know, markets or reporters trying to really always get just that nugget piece of news? Yeah, right? well, certainly there's a lot of that going on, I would say. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I guess I would, to, to put a more constructive spin on it, the, the markets and market participants are always wondering what we're going to do. They're, they're always wondering what we're, what we're thinking. And when, when market moves happen, that's really a constructive thing. It's never going to be exactly what, we, what we're thinking. But nonetheless, it's constructive that, that the market, in effect, is doing your work for you if it correctly understands your reaction function. So that's a maybe a more constructive way to And, and, and is it correctly understanding <laughs> what you're saying right so now? So I would say, by, by and large, I think over uh, since last fall when we, when we pivoted uh, to, uh, to raise rates and get where we are now, since then, markets have been um, pretty well aligned. I wouldn't bless any particular day, for example, but pretty well aligned with where we're going. And, and right now, uh, you know, the market pricing is pretty close to where the, the summary of economic projections from, what was it, two weeks ago, was. So my colleagues and I wrote down numbers for the end of this year for our policy rate between three and three and a half percent, and markets are broadly right in that space somewhere. And then for, for next year, between three and a half and four percent. So broadly speaking, I, I, I think it's working. And you know, we, 
we're all, everything we say in terms of forward guidance, to your point, is always going to be conditional on the things that happen between, you know, between now when you give the guidance and when the actual event happens. And sometimes markets can forget about the conditionality part. But is there a problem, actually, with, with forward guidance in this kind of environment because it gets priced in straight away? So, so it feels sometimes like you know, markets lead and central banks follow because of the forward guidance. It, it doesn't really feel that way at all from where I'm sitting. It, it feels <laughs> quite the opposite. Uh, and no, it, as I said, I think, this is, I think people will look back on this period and say that we were able to have financial conditions tighten quite substantially. And we've only, we've only had three meetings at which we raised rates. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the forward rate curve is, is pricing in you know, a rate path that looks a whole lot like the, the summary of economic projections that my colleagues and I submitted in June. So that's a good thing. That's the market understanding and finding credible what we're, what we're writing down. Now, of course, it's all highly conditional, but nonetheless, I'd say that's a positive thing. Yeah. Do you agree, Madame Magan? Is it a positive? Yeah. I, well, I would agree, you know, from, from our vintage point, we are on a normalization path. We have signaled that very clearly. We've started that back in December. And, you know, the, 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 the key assessment is the assessment of the medium-term outlook. The variables that we look at, the data that we look at, I think you know, everyone is aware of that. And most people operate on the basis of the same data, the same information. And I think that our reaction function is what matters. And as long as that is understood, the fact that we are on this normalization path, that we are gradual but optional, that we're going to be data dependent, we've indicated very clearly what's likely to happen in July, uh, well, Yes. What's likely to happen in September? Yes. And, you know, in, 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 in the path that we are on, I think that markets have full understanding and appreciation of what we are doing, how we're doing it. And then the level of uncertainty as it clears will probably help us towards this optionality that I was describing earlier on. Governor Bell, do you, again, do you agree, actually, with the, with the market function so far? Have they broadly understood what, you know, the central bank's trying to do? Yes, I think they have. I, I think the tricky thing that you see, certainly I would say we see, is that you know, we, we can obviously see direct market pricing. We can have an implied market pro curve which prices in what we're going to do. We also, as you probably know, and we just started doing this recently, publish... Uh, a market survey at the same time as the meetings. And that actually shows a lower path uh, uh, of, of rates. So we spend quite a bit of time understanding the difference between those two. I don't think it's actually hard to explain because I think the under, underlying reason is that the market curve prices in the risk and the risk is on the upside. And I would agree with that. So, uh, whereas the, whereas the, the survey is a straightforward um, you know, point, point number, the curve has got, got, got the risk in it. So I think, you know, for me, the best way to look at that difference is the risk. But that, that is a risk in that sense. It's, a, it's, it, and it's important to see that, you know, that perspective. Uh, Mr. Yes, absolutely. Not to get ahead of ourselves or to have, uh, um, to become big-headed about it. But there's a point that was made in a previous panel, which we all agreed over lunch, which is that it's not... It's not a science what we're doing. It, there's an element of art, and now whether you characterize it as art or not, but it, it is not just driven by sciences. And, and we know that models have had their, their shortfalls, uh, particularly turning points. So there is also that element that is sort of uh, privy to the deliberations that we have in our various governing councils and FOMCs and what have you. Yeah, yes. Can, can I just add? We're, we're talking a lot about markets and how we react to markets. Actually, to Christine's point, we're really, we're, the way we're thinking about it is what, what policy setting do we need to put, to put down to achieve the real economy goals that we're working on? You know, that we, that we, and and that's, that's what our, we're, we're not thinking, well, let's try to match up with the markets. We're thinking, what's the right policy based on our, you know, the, the incoming data and the evolving outlook and all those things that will get us to 2% inflation while ideally keeping the uh, labor market strong. So it's really, all, we're talking so much about markets, no, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. want to, people to think that that's actually yeah. what, we're, yeah. what we're aiming for. We still have an hour on the panel, so <laughs> we, we, have, we have time. Is, is there a piece of the, of the, I mean, do you worry about yield curve inversion, though? Is there a piece of, of that that makes you worry, or do you just, you know? So we, I would so. say this, we, we monitor a broad range of financial conditions. Honestly, uh, 
the shape of the yield curve is not is not a top line worry for right now. Our our focus is very intensely on setting policy in order to get inflation down to two percent. Yeah. That's what we're working on. That's our we understand that that's our primary focus right yeah. now. The labor market, of course, is extremely uh, uh, tight in the United States. So we we uh, so our, our focus is getting inflation under control. It's and. It's very important that uh, people understand how committed we are to doing that. And that, that, again, that's what we're thinking about. Yeah, and, and I want to go back to the real economy and inflation in a second. But Mr. Carson, what do you make of some of the, the you know, what we've seen in market volatility? Is it, is, it, is it just a readjustment? Is it a misunderstanding? Is there something that you know, could turn uglier? Well, you know, uh, markets are responding also to the circumstances. Uh, I think as policymakers to some extent have been surprised because there has been news that really are news and that were, were very difficult to anticipate. Markets are doing the same. And we have to, and we, you know this very well, uh, markets are turning around very big positions. They're adjusting their portfolios. Uh, we are talking about a circumstance where for a very, very long period of time, uh, we had uh, tailwinds in the bond markets, you know, the, we had very low and, and falling real rates of interest, falling nominal interest rates. So trading bonds was relatively simple. We had very big expectations for earnings into the future, a lot of interest in different sectors of the economy. Uh, therefore, uh, it was easy sailing for quite some time. But you know, the world has changed. <laughs> the world that investors are facing and the world, world that we are facing. And central banks need to, to do their work, uh, not, not as an objective in, in itself, but as all these uh, central bankers have been saying, to, to, to fix a problem, which is inflation, and then continue with a, a much better world moving forward. So there are certain circumstances in markets where frictions are bigger. Uh, trading conditions are not always the same. I mean, you, you get cir circumstances of crowded trades because at some point uh, the same type of investors are trying to do the same operation and liquidity is not necessarily there. Something that for me has been very positive is that central banks, uh, the leading central banks, have been able to uh, implement their money policy adjustments without really generating such big, so uh, any, any, any sort of, of market disruptions. Markets have been performing well, liquidity is there, market making is, is going forward. Yes, there has been some disruptions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm not talking about the cyber world, that's another, <laughs> another <laughs> uh, fish, or how do you say it, another kettle of fish. Kettle of fish. But you know, I think, I think that, the, that, that the markets have been working really well. And, and, and yes, behind, behind the actions of central bank, there is always the concern mar that markets should be working adequately because you don't want to have f financial instability. At the same time, you need markets working well for the transmission of monetary policy. And so far, I would, I would say so good. Yeah, but at what point, and I, I think that maybe the last point on, on markets is how much do central banks need to deal with markets, Mr. Carson, to see, you know, to, to I guess impact the real economy? That's for, for you. For yeah. How much do we deal with them? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, how much do you need to, to focus on markets to make sure that also the real economy is quite strong? Well, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time uh, analyzing markets, uh, and, and all of that is, is fed into uh, what impact those changes have on the inflation outlook. I mean, that's why we do it. No. With, the second, well, with the second objective, as Christine rightly says, of course, about market stability, um, because after all, we've also got financial stability obligations and, and responsibilities. I mean, I think if I go back to the panel this morning very briefly, I think the point was rightly made that it's turning points that are, are the hardest. Uh, often to, to read, and it's not just for us, it's for markets as well. And I think certainly when I look at the UK economy at the moment, you know, it's very clear that the economy is now starting to slow. Uh, we are at something of a turning point in that respect. And I think the fact that you know, markets are having to take that on board and that you know, the data can be quite choppy at that sort of point in time 
is reflected in some of the short-run movements in markets. Now, I do think one of, you know, one of the essential things for central banks is to look through that short run. Yeah. Yeah, we have to extract the information and then look through it because obviously our objectives are much further forward in that sense uh, in, terms of, in terms of low inflation and returning to target. But in terms of, you know, of taking the information out of markets, yeah, it's a very important activity for us. Um, Chair Powell, Paul Krugman, I think on Friday, said that the number one risk to the U.S. economy is that the Fed could overdo it because inflation could come down as quickly as it went up. Is that really possible? Well, it, we'd certainly welcome inflation coming down more quickly than expected, uh, and we would take that into account in our, in our policy. So, I, I, look, I, as I mentioned earlier, we, um, we're very strongly committed to using our tools to get inflation to come down. The way to do that is to slow down growth, ideally keep it positive, and as I mentioned, supply and demand get back into balance. So that, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Is there a risk that we would go too far? Certainly there's a risk. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree that it's the, the biggest risk to the economy. I think that, you know, the, the, the bigger mistake to make, let's put it that way, would be to fail to restore price stability. And it's, I, to, to um, what Augustine was speaking to earlier, a, a low inflation environment at, at, or regime is what we've had. And that is one in which inflation is low and um, no one pays any attention to, uh, to inflation. And that's called rational inattention because it doesn't matter. Yeah. When, when there's a big inflation spike, uh, if it's going to go away, we would ignore it and, and, yeah. but, and, and sort of play through it because it'll go away and it won't affect people's understanding. But to the extent there are a series of shocks, um, it does become rational for people to pay more and more attention, and I think the clock is kind of running on, you know, how long will, you know, will, the, will you remain in a low inflation regime yeah. where most of the changes in inflation are actually idiosyncratic as opposed to yeah. broadly across the macro economy. So the risk is that you, that because of a, multiple, a multiplicity of shocks, you transition, you start to transition into a higher inflation regime. And, our job is literally to prevent that from happening, and we will prevent that from happening. We will not allow a transition from a low inflation environment into a high inflation environment. Is there a point where actually the so inflation expectations get de-anchored? That That's another way of th saying it or thinking about it. It's the same thing, same idea. And the thing is, you never really know. You, there's no way to know in real time. We, we all study inflation expectations very carefully. And if you look across the broad scope of short, medium, and long-term expectation, you'd still say, that we have credibility, that they're well anchored, but there's a clock running here where we have high inflation running now for more than a year, and you know the, no one should assume it would it would be bad risk management to just assume that those longer term inflation expectations will remain anchored indefinitely in the face of persistent high inflation. So we're not doing that as a risk management matter. We are you know we're working very hard on the on the part that we can affect, which is the demand side. We can't affect the supply side really. But we can affect the, the large parts of the U.S. economy where there's surplus demand, and that's really our focus. Is there a data point that you watch for to actually see whether there is a de-anchoring? Or you know, where do you see it first, basically, if it spirals? Yeah, the point is not to see it at all. We, we, we can't, once we start seeing that, you know, the, the cost of dealing with, with, uh, 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 with higher inflation goes up so much to the extent you find yourself in, in a higher inflation regime that you just, you just can't allow it to happen. So you, if, if you're starting to see serious de-anchoring of, and we're not, yep. of, of longer term inflation expectations, then, then you're behind. And I, I, th I think right now it, we're, we're doing what we need to do, which is to, just to move expeditiously yep. and, and yep. into restrictive territory fairly quickly. I think that's what we need to be doing so that we don't, we don't find ourselves in that situation. President Lagarde, what's the situation like in, in Europe? And we had a pretty ugly CPI number from Spain this morning. Yeah, numbers from Germany that are below yeah. uh, what economists expected. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's a question of waiting until the 1st of July when we have the consolidated number for, uh, for the whole of the euro area, and we'll see, because we are, we are data dependent. But, you know, just like, uh, like Jay, our, our mission, our mandate, our job is to uh, provide price stability, which we have defined as, as 2%. So, we currently have inflation at, uh, you know, forecast uh, 6.8 for this year, moving down to 3.5 and 2.1 in 24. All of that is above target throughout the whole uh, projection period, and we need to do what we have to do, which is to bring it back to 2%, and, and we shall do so. Now, of course, we are not exactly in the same situation as, as, as Augustine was saying. We need to look at our markets. We need to look at forces. We need to look at how the uncertainty that we have on the horizon is going to clear. 
And I think that in that respect, what happens on the energy front, what happens on the war front, unfortunately, what happens in relation to wage negotiations, uh, and, and how inflation expectations continue to, uh, re to, to stay anchored as they have re-anchored, uh, other the, the, some of the elements that we will be looking at very carefully in the job that we have to do to bring inflation back to 2% over the medium term. That's the same determination. Yeah, Governor Bailey? Well, I agree. I mean, I, like Christine, I am concerned about how the, the war front and the uh, energy supply front is going to evolve. I think that is the major risk. I think, it, by the way, if I say, I mean, we had an inflation number out last week, and I, what I thought is that yeah, on the surface, it was pretty much in line with what we expected. Underneath the surface, there was a, there was a sign that we saw a shift in the makeup of inflation from the, the good supply shock to the energy and food shock, which I would sort of characterize as the post-COVID supply chain shock, at moving more into the, sadly, into the Russia-Ukraine world. And uh, obviously, we watched that very, very, very carefully uh, as we go through the year. As we said in our last monetary policy report, yeah, unfortunately, there is going to be a further step up in UK inflation later this year because that, that's a product of the way the energy price cap and domestic energy prices are set based on the data that we've observed over the last few months. And we have to, yeah, we have to take that into account. But as, as Christine and Jay have said, you know, the key for us is to bring inflation back down to target, and that's what we will do. I mean, hindsight is a beautiful thing, I know. And I also know the ECB published a paper <laughs> and saying, you know, what, what you got wrong on inflation. But going forward, Mr. Carstens, how do we need to look at inflation differently? So, for example, in the U.S., and I'll ask the same to Chair Powell, you know, the, the stimulus, did we miscalculate the impact this would have on, on inflation? Can I, can I just yes. say one thing? I think it's a very healthy exercise to actually assess why what? you were off, off the mark. And, uh, you know, if, if all of you actually do the same exercise, you will probably realize for most of you that actually energy was vastly underestimated and that, you know, bottlenecks yeah. were also expected to clear much faster than everybody had expected. I, I don't think the ECB is alone in that camp. Yeah. We're the first one to have acknowledged it publicly, but I think it's, it's a good exercise. Yeah. No, I mean, in, in the previous panel, for example, and the, if you look also into annual, recent annual economic re, 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 reports, you see that, for example, some very, very long-term health key components of the toolbox that we had to analyze inflation has not turned out to be so reliable. Uh, like, for example, the, the traditional uh, Phillips curve. That has been a workhorse, workhorse for all of us. That, to some extent, uh, ha kept, I would say, for some time, uh, giving the indication that inflation could not rise that fast. Uh, we faced many, many limitations like that. I mean, I, I have to be very transparent. Last year, we tried to crank out some num numbers of inflation, and we put them out there. And, uh, you know, here's one of the researchers that did the job, and he had a hard time cranking up higher numbers <laughs> as much as he tried. Uh, and we had it at the end of the day, day wrong. And part of it, I mean, I'm not blaming it to him, you know, it was my responsibility too. But that was the, that was the toolbox we had, you no? Know? Now we find, find that, you know, there are many different uh, hidden relationships or very key aspects about inflation expectations, uh, expectation formations, situation in labor markets that can give you non-linearities, yeah. you know? Therefore, we had a very nice model for normal circumstances, but as it has been said uh, periodically here or, or in a reiterative fashion, uh, you know, uh, turning points is what, are, uh, what is very, very difficult. So we have entered into dynamics that are, uh, are very different. Mm -hmm. So I think where there needs to be a lot of work is, and we started doing some of that job recently in, in the VIS, is to understand much better what is happening with inflation under the hood. Why some relative prices eventually become, a, become more contagious, to use that word, and start spreading around. How, why some shocks are more perdurable than others. 
why there are some prices that, that generate more spillovers, mm -hmm. what determines the frequency of firms' revision of their prices, which certainly increases with inflation. Mm -hmm. The new technology that we have mm -hmm. talked about, I mean, now we have Amazons and we have all these uh, markets that probably were not there, certainly were not there when the CPIs were calculated a few, a few years ago. So there is a lot of things that we need to, 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 to catch up. So I think it's a, it's, it's a challenge for us. I think as we are accumulating all this information, I'm sure also uh, will give us, and is given already, more leading indicators of what, for what inflation is doing. And that will be very, very hel helpful to, to, to calibrate, a, to calibrate a, a, a response. So yes, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, inflation will evolve. The inflationary pressures we're facing today are very different than the ones we had in the yeah. 70s. And I'm sure that the, the bout of inflation we might see in some decades forward will be also very, very different. So we need to preserve that nimbleness uh, analytically to approach and also be very mindful that we need the right instruments. And another thing that, that has been very useful is that the different banks have been, the central banks have been able to adapt their instruments to the monetary policy according to the circumstances. But does everybody on the panel think they understand inflation better now than they did four or five months ago? Because you could also have, again, you know, going back to Krugman's but point. Can I say something? I, yeah. I mean, certainly I believe that we understand it a little bit better, not fully. No. There is a bleak, a, a sort of a big, I wouldn't say black box, but certainly gray box, where I think in the profession of economists we need to do better. Yeah. And that's understanding aggregate supply. We are, at least I myself consider myself an economist that I was training, trained under the dominance of aggregate demand. And we know a lot how to aggregate demand response to interest rates, how they respond to income, how monetary policy and fiscal policy has a transmission mechanism to aggregate demand. But you know, we usually take aggregate supply as given. And it's very complex, it's very, very complex. And I think we need to understand far better uh, aggregate supply. One, one confusion that is out there today, I think, is that the flexibility, sorry, the flexibility or the inelasticity of supply in the short term is there, but that doesn't necessarily ma makes it the same as a bottleneck. What is the difference? How impact that on inflation? So I think the understanding of aggregate supply mm -hmm that also includes labor markets is of the essence. So from, from the challenges we are taking forward, for me that is one that is very important. I like the idea of a gray box. In addition to aggregate sectorial supply, as we, yeah, as yeah, we, yeah. we, we learned this morning with great interest, is also yeah, worth it. Jane made the point earlier, and it's very important, that yeah, we've had a series of supply shocks. This is the thing. I mean, I, you know, the word transient has become discredited, but it, it isn't really in one sense because that was built on a single supply shock idea. You know, that supply shock can work its way through. The duration of that supply shock can often be shorter than the response of you know, transmission response of monetary policy. Now, we've not been in that world. We've been in a world where we've had a series of supply shocks. I mean, we I look at our shocks. Yes, we had an initial demand shock from COVID, but then we had you know, a supply shock with the supply chain recovery problems. We've had, uh, obviously, a, a very serious supply shock coming from uh, energy and the, the war. Mm -hmm. And we've had a labor market shock in the UK because the labor force has reduced in size. And it's, as Jay was saying, it's how you deal with a series of supply shocks, large supply shocks, mm -hmm. with no air gap between them, um, which, of course, feeds through into expectations because put them all together, they're not transitory in the uh, traditional mm -hmm. sense of the term. Chair Powell? One way to say it would be, we, I think we now understand better how little we understand <laughs> about That's inflation. That's not very reassuring. No, it, you know, it, honestly, this was, this was unpredicted. I, I was looking at our, um, uh, at the time of our June meeting, one year ago, the, of the 35 uh, uh, people who file uh, with a survey of professional forecasters, 34 of them had inflation below 4% for last year. And of course, it was way above 4%. So, Really, really, everyone had the same model, which was the Phillips curve model, and it just was not capable of producing high inflation. But what it was missing 
was something that's completely missing in the data for 40 years, which is a, basically a collapse of the supply side. Yeah. You know, the, the, the U.S. economy is famously adaptable. You know, it, does, it has the minimum of structural rigidities, all that kind of thing. And yet here they are. So, you, so what you had was very strong demand, but hitting effectively a vertical supply curve. So ordinarily when people want to buy cars, which they really did because they didn't want to ride on public transportation, rates were low, they had all these savings, the car companies would make more cars and they might raise prices too. In this case, they couldn't make as many cars. So, so what you got was straight up the vertical supply curve, a big price increase. But I also think in principle, at least, that process could work in reverse. So that as demand comes down, you, you could, you know, inflation could actually come down more quickly than would be, than would, you know, there, there are other relationships that people think about when they think about how do you get inflation down, which are more typical of a simply overheated economy and, and, and entrenched inflation, the sacrifice ratio and those kinds of things. But I think this could be, I don't know that it will be, but it could be different because it's just that process working in reverse, potentially. Do you see that process, um, you know, President Lagarde working in reverse? So actually, I mean, I know it's different because you of know, the proximity to Russia. What we're seeing at the moment is more this, this uh, swing or substitution that was described earlier uh, in the day, where, you know, because of COVID, everybody suddenly decided to stop using any kind of services, particularly if there was social yeah. distancing about it, and move to, to goods, hence the car industry in the U.S. and, um, you know, stationary bicycle rather than the fitness club. And, and, and now we are seeing this sort of substitution back to services where people who've been deprived of restaurants, hotels, transportation, theaters, and all the rest of it, that, that side of it is currently booming and is sustaining the recovery that is otherwise under the various series of shock that uh, uh, Andrew was alluding to. So how, how, how these things are going to evolve in view of the uncertainty that we have in front of us here in Europe is something that really uh, remains to be, to be seen. But how difficult, President Lagarde, is it to, for example, model a gas embargo from, from Russia? And did, and, well, it has, it has proven, look, it has proven extremely difficult. And, and as we have seen mm -hmm. from uh, the sort of uh, misunderstanding or, or, or wrong assessment uh, that we have seen in the last couple of years, that mm -hmm. is difficult. For sure, and you know the rest is for the moment more in the scenario planning world than, than in the uh, remodeling of what's going to happen on the uh, on gas prices. Um, Mr. Carson is talking about emerging markets a little bit. So first, you know, it, it's um, I don't know whether they're coming to their stride because they're used to the volatility, but there are huge implications, of course, of what the dollar is doing. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, a very strong dollar implies for many of them very tight global financial conditions. And uh, so far, again, as I mentioned, the exchange rate, the uh, impact or pressure has been contained, both at the, at the cost of very high rates. Mm -hmm. what, what is a little bit concerning, not that uh, it couldn't be managed, but uh, for, for some emerging markets, this is arriving at the time where there is high uh, corporate debt and high sovereign debt. And therefore, some fiscal prudence is important at the time where emerging markets are facing uh, still very severe ch challenges. Many of them haven't made as much progress with, for example, vaccination than in other countries. Uh, also, for, for many of them, the impact of uh, the increase in commodity prices, in par particularly in food, and in energy is very important. I mean, usually commodity price, commodities per se, food, foodstuffs, and energy uh, occupies a much larger proportion in the in the co co in the in their basket than in advanced economies. Uh, so that obviously reflects itself in more social need. And well, of course, uh, many governments, according to their capacities, they are doing programs to assist people. Uh, so at the end of the day, they are, they are on, a, on a tight situation. They have to manage things very prudently. Uh, I think they are, as if we compare this with other periods, emerging markets are better prepared. Uh, but I think that, uh, that, that that the challenges are there. I think, I think 
a, a big challenge for many emerging markets, uh, including, I, I would say, uh, China, is, mm -hmm. is how to get growth back at a much healthier pace, you know? I think the, the growth in emerging markets has slowed down, not, not, not now, but even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to some extent, the virtues of globalization have sort of run out of steam, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and therefore the, the, the relevance of structural reforms are very important. We need to look much better into how to get growth going mm. independently of the use from fiscal and monetary policy. And to a large extent, that also applies to advanced economies. Thank you. Um, Governor Bailey, do you think inflation in the UK will be longer, will, will be more elevated for longer than in other parts of the world? Well, I mean, as, as Christine has said, um, we are going to be affected by the shock that Christine described in terms of energy prices in Europe, because essentially it's a common it's a common shock in geographical Europe, I uh, use that term carefully, um, because it's a single, particularly for gas, it's a, it's a single supply system. So although we don't actually import a large amount of uh, gas from Russia, it doesn't, in a sense, the price is formed outside that, uh, that particular. So, so in that sense, it would be similar. I think where I would, as things stand, expect uh, some more persistence in the headline rate is because we do have, as I mentioned earlier, this... Uh, price capping system and domestic uh, energy prices. Uh, at the moment, it's a six-month uh, cap, but there is a proposal to take it down to three months. But other things equal, you would imagine that that would put a bit more persistence in. And we will, of course, have to explain that, because if we can observe a, you know, a downward path of underlying inflation, we will have to be very careful to explain that if, if that's how, it's, uh, how it emerges. But does Brexit actually make bringing down inflation harder? Well, uh, Brexit, I should say, it, it's, it's very hard uh, at the moment, if not impossible, to separate out the immediate effects of Brexit and the immediate effects of COVID. So it, when I look at trade and when I look at the uh, labor market particularly, um, you can see effects taking place, but you can see that COVID and Brexit are having some effects. And the reason I say that is because the Bank of England for some time now has had a, had a you know, sort of a path of a Brexit mm -hmm. effect in its, in, in its projections, which said there would be a fall in trade intensity initially, and over a much longer period of time, there would be an adjustment to that. And, and we haven't yet seen any, anything to, to vary that assumption. Does the fall in sterling actually help with the economy? Well, I, I, we're not, we don't target the exchange rate, let's be clear. The, the exchange rate is one of many inputs to um, many, many influences on inflation, and that's the way I treat it. So, it's, so it has, has it been a positive? I mean, we used to say that it was a positive if it was lower. No, I, I don't sort of attribute sort of, you know, positives and negatives. I'm not surprised, uh, by the way, that the path of sterling for the, for, for the reason that, as I said earlier, I think the UK economy is probably weakening rather earlier and somewhat more than others. Um, I think that's, you know, been somewhat evident now for a, for a few months. And of course, it is over the last few months it's happened. But I, I think, it, you know, I do, in our system today, we do not attribute good and bad to movements in the exchange rate. It, it's one of the many things that goes into the, uh, into the analysis process in terms of how we think about uh, the evolution of inflation. I was going to ask you about the dollar and whether that helps with price stability, dollar strength. So, like Andrew, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have responsibility for the level of the dollar. That's the elected government's job. That's the Treasury Department's job. And so it's just another financial condition to us. And, uh, and since our economy, you know, the ex external sector in our economy is so much smaller than it is for the others here, uh, it's, it's not that important. But uh, dollar has been strong, which would tend to be disinflationary, but only at the very, at the, at the very margin. I mean, I, I think, I think uh, what, we, what we're seeing these days is, is our adjustments in uh, exchange rates. But I think the way of thinking of those adjustments in, in most economies, including in emerging market economies, are part of the adjustment process. I mean, they are endogenous variables. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the dollar is stronger because the US economy is stronger, because interest rates uh, uh, are higher, and also how the shocks that are around are affecting the different economies. 
So the fact that you have a very strong commodity price in, in Europe uh, uh, with gas and so on and so forth is very logical to think that the real exchange rate will depreciate. And that's part of the adjustment, you know. So I think, I think we're in a world where in most of the cases, uh, uh, exchange rates are part of the adjustment. In some cases, in particularly in emerging markets, it has, it has more of an impact in the monetary policy management is because the pass-through for moving of the exchange rate into prices is much higher mm -hmm. than in advanced economies. So in advanced economies, you know, it doesn't, in, 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 unless there are huge swings, the impact on the on the trajectory of, of inflation is 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 not that relevant. Chair Powell, um, Mr. Carson was talking about a gray box. What's your gray box? Is there something that you wish you knew that that would help in, in setting monetary policy? Only one thing. Yeah, no, I, I'd go back to the same thing really, which is what what did we what did we get wrong? And that really was looking at these supply side issues and believing that they would be resolved relatively quickly. And that by that I mean. There, was going to be, there were going to be vaccinations, everyone would get vaccinated, so the millions of people who dropped out of the labor force would come right back in, so wages wouldn't be under such pressure. That didn't happen for a range of reasons. It didn't happen. In addition, the, the bottlenecks and the shortages haven't been alleviated yet, and then on the back of that comes the new shock in the form of the war. Um, but so we, but it, wasn't, it was, wasn't something wrong with our models because it wasn't in the models at all. It was, it was a question of how to assess the persistence of these supply side shocks. And I, I do think that there'll be, to Augustine's point, there'll be, a, and there is a lot of work going on to get smarter about the supply side. It, in the nature of it though, it was a deep in the tail kind of a risk. And those are, those are very hard to predict and assess when they come. Yeah. Because monetary policy is not an exact science, how often do you actually speak on the phone to exchange ideas? Do you, like, do you call each other and say, like, well, I've done it this well, way? I, 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 what I, 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 yeah. can, I can help out. I mean, uh, because part of my job, part of my job is to be able to attract them to Basel uh, two times a, a, every two months to have very, very deep and uh, open exchange of views. Uh, we and do we talk, and we're not going to tell And you all show up. We speak quite often. We speak quite often. Quite a lot, <laughs> but you're not going to tell me. Um, President Lagarde, the ECB decided to apply flexibility to reinvestments from Friday, July the 1st. What will be the guideposts? We decided. Look, I think, if you allow, I'd like to just come back to why that is. Yeah. Uh, because I think that... Um, this risk of fragmentation that is much talked about is something that is very inherent to the European construction yeah. and to the fact that we have 19, soon 20, but let's say 19 for the moment, member states that each have their respective fiscal policy, that each have their respective um, financial markets. And as a result of that, our unique monetary policy has to be transmitted throughout this imperfect um, market of house, which has no fiscal union, no monetary union, no capital markets union. And as a result of that, we just have to make sure that our monetary policy stance is actually transmitted throughout the entire um, euro area. And the two of them, I, I think I use that word, I don't know if it exists in English, but they are consubstantial. For our stance to be effective, it has to be transmitted throughout, okay? So to do that, if we see that there are unwarranted um, disruption to that transmission, and if our stance is impaired as a result, mm -hmm. we need to take action. And that is the reason we decided that we would use, as of, you're right, Friday, that's what I said yesterday, we would use, we would use the flexibility in the reinvestment of our pandemic emergency purchase program uh, redemptions in order to address the potential risk of uh, fragmentation. Second, we also decided, and, uh, and it's work in progress, so I'm not going to comment upon it. I know that some, some would like to have details and understand before <laughs> everybody else, and particularly before the governing council, what the details of that instrument will be, but we decided to reinforce our capacity 
to properly yeah. transmit our monetary policy by dividing, devising a new tool that will be considered by the governing council of the ECB on July the 21st. So don't waste your time asking me for details, <laughs> criteria, conditions, safeguards. All I said is that it has to be effective, it has to be proportional, it has yeah. to include the right level of safeguards. And that's all I will say at this point. Okay. How do you direct and staff? And it will be effective, and it will be proportional, and it will have safeguards, <laughs> and it will be there, believe me. So how do you direct staff? I'm going to try my luck one more time. How do you direct staff when they design this new tool? <laughs> I said what I had to the say. The lady is not you. for turning, <laughs> is, is, is the, the, the famous way. Um, how do you look at China, Mr. Karstens? How should we look at China at the moment? Well, I mean, uh, it is of the essence that uh, things start improving more quickly in China. I mean, certainly we need the growth that has come from China. Mm -hmm. They play a very important role in, uh, in, in the supply chains. Uh, I mean, many of the tensions we're seeing around the world uh, could be mitigated by having higher growth rates around the world. I mean, part of the, 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 I mean, w the way we have started this conversation was uh, trying to assess or you wanting to hear uh, our thoughts about how can we bring down inflation without affecting growth. If we have other sources of growth, that would make the whole, the whole adjustment process simpler. Now, what is one major engine of growth that has not been uh, contributing, contributing as much as it could? And I have to say China, no? They have problems that are well known uh, one that I hope that can be resolved soon is the one in the in the housing market. Uh, I mean, the housing market has been, or the sector, that sector, it's a very important uh, contributor to growth. Uh, a lot of, certainly, very much impact in the rest of of uh, of the of the global economy, and. Uh, it's, it's a sector where the Chinese authorities have been working a lot, trying to bring it back to its foot, and they, hopefully they're close. But uh, I mean, I would say at this stage, uh, uh, for their own sake, they're not growing as much as, 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 as they certainly would like, and certainly they're not growing at the pace I would like them to see growth, because I think it would help us a lot in trying to solve some of the tensions we're living today. Do you think we'll see, Chair um, Powell, more you know, deglobalization and how that will impact our economies going forward? So there's certainly, certainly a threat of that, and it, this is not the work of the central banks, but I do think it would be, it would be a plus if, if we were to find a way to, uh, you know, to, for China to take part diplomatically and economically uh, according to a common set of rules and that would be a big plus for global growth if we could get back on a path to that. But it's obviously, it's, it, that's a work, the work of elected governments, not for us. In terms of globalization, yes, I mean, it, you, you can imagine a world. It's not hard to imagine a world where we break into these blocks again. And um, that, would, that would be a world of lower productivity and, uh, and lower incomes over time. It doesn't, necessarily, it doesn't have, to have to happen that way. Um, people are looking at, at uh, shorter and more durable supply chains. Um, it's not clear how much of that will happen, and if so, what would be the effects? Those that could also be that could be more secure, but perhaps, uh, you know, n not as not as uh, efficient as as the the long but but fragile supply chains that we've had. So I think it's a it's a very important question, and there's certainly a risk that that the benefits of globalization would be lost. But obviously, there were there were benefits and there were costs to to the advanced economy certainly. I mean, a question for all of you, and Chair Powell, I'll start with you. What have we learned about you know, the, the last 10 years of monetary policy, some of the tools that were used, be it QE or in other parts of the world, even negative rates? So we, we, the last 10 years were, were, so far, the height of the disinflationary forces that we faced. And really, it goes back before the global financial crisis, but really since the global financial crisis, we had very low inflation. We, in the United States, we had 3.5% unemployment for a couple of years, or right in that range for a couple of years, and inflation didn't, didn't react at all. So we had a very, we, and we, that gave us the ability 
to really lean into the maximum employment mandate, and we did that, and I think that was the right thing to do in that world. That world seems to be gone now, at least for the time being. And uh, you know, we're living with, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're, we're living with different forces now and have to, have to uh, think about monetary policy in a very different way. So I think, I think if you want to know the lessons to be learned of the last 10 years, look at our framework. Those were all based on a low inflation you know, environment that we had. And now we're in this new world where it's, it's quite different. With, uh, with higher inflation and many supply shocks and uh, strong inflationary forces around the world. It's quite a different environment. President Lagarde, how do you think we'll look at you know, the, some, well, negative rates, first of all? Well, I, lo I look at it uh, in a similar way uh, to, to Jay. And, and I think the last 10 years have been 10 years of heroic fight against disinflationary forces. Uh, with central banks demonstrating great um, agility to innovate and find sometimes alternative, accommodative ways of, of dealing with, with forces that have nothing to do with what we are experiencing now. So we're certainly learning from that period, but we are in a new, uh, in a new environment, which also, I think, will force us to, to show agility and, and capacity to respond fast to data that we are, um, we are receiving at, at an accelerated pace and, and with a scene that is changing uh, geopolitically uh, as well as economically. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kostens, do you think... But I don't want to sound too dark because I think that <laughs> there are also good things happening. You know, I was reflecting on, on your comments, Jay, and, you know, think back uh, December, when was it, December 20 when we thought that this, this pandemic was going to hit us for the next two years, at least, mm -hmm. until such time when vaccination would, would come to market. And vaccination came about in a matter of you know, nine months, as opposed to the three years that it normally takes. In the same way, everybody expected a couple of weeks ago that the Geneva Agreement of WTO would be a, f a complete illusion, would never happen. Well, certain things happen when, when there is goodwill, agility, creativity. So I have great faith in uh, human inventivity and talent, particularly when it includes women. <laughs> point, though, a lot of these problems are, are happening because the, uh, the recovery and the expansion have been so much stronger than, yes. and, and faster than expected. If you look in the U.S. labor market as an example now, it's a very good time to be in the labor market. You can, you know, there are two job openings effectively for, for every unemployed person. So people are switching jobs, they're getting pay increases. It's, you know, it's a terrific labor market. The problem is, that, that wages are moving up in some areas that, at levels that are not consistent over time with 2% inflation. So it's kind of overheated. Nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct of, of, uh, of a very strong recovery. Uh, Governor Bay, on, on pay increases, I mean, the UK is going through a bit of a bumpy ride with, with um, a, a lot of pay increases. How do you see that developing? Well, of course, it's a, it's, it's a reflection of the, of the inflation world we're in at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm on record as having said a few months ago that, and I'll be careful because I'll, I'll be, get it right and precise in terms of what I said, that I think, you know, you know very high pay increases, trying, and particularly, uh, you know, but, and this applies to both pay increases and price setting by companies. If everybody tries to beat the, beat the inflation, and particularly the version we're having, which is this imported inflation shock, which we just, you know, we can't avoid, then it will set the second round effects off. And, and of course, yes, we are seeing some of that tension unfold. I would have to note that I would note that rather more people seem to be agreeing with me today than were doing several months ago. Um, but that's not the point. I mean, the point is, yes, I, you know, I think it was likely that we would see this. But I think, I have to say, the point about second round effects holds as much today as it did then. I mean, that's the risk. And that's why we will you know, set monetary policy obviously to offset those if they uh, emerge to get back to target. We will have to do that, and that's, a, am afraid, you know, a, a thin code for saying the more they emerge, the, the higher rates will have to be. But what sort of pay rises could be alarming for the Bank of England? Is anything above 2% inflationary? Well, I don't, I don't think it's, that's the right way to look at it, because obviously there's always a productivity angle to it in, in terms of, of, of how pay is set, and it's very important that, you know, I made a general comment about second round effects, but of course pay is set in a market and that's important and it must continue to be set in a market. So it's wrong to say across the economy this is the right number because it isn't. 
uh, you know, different cases and, and different situations. But I would just emphasize this point about second round effects, which is the, the crucial point for monetary policy. Uh, Mr. Carsons, has there been an over-reliance actually on monetary policy in the, in the last 10 years? Well, I mean, I think, I think in the, even going a little bit further away, 2007, 2008, monetary policy needed to respond, to put it in a different way, lack of resilience in growth. And yes, to some extent, policies that traditionally are meant to support uh, some fluctuations in the business cycle have probably been used a little bit more, more with probably in a, in, in, in a, in a more lasting way. And my, my sense is uh, the role of fiscal and monetary policy to stabilize uh, the business cycle into the future are getting, uh, are, are hitting limits. In fiscal policy is obvious because there are issues of debt sustainability or can be issues of debt sustainability. And well now if we, we had a long period to, or that where monetary policy could have an impact on growth because as Christine said, as uh, Jay Powell and, and, and Andrew have said, we, we faced a very, uh, I would say, specific period of time of very low, very low inflation and where monetary policy could make, if you had the instrument, why not use it, no? But I think, I think what we should learn, and this is not only, I mean, at the end of the day, the economies do not depend only on monetary policy. At the end of the day, they depend on fiscal, monetary, but also many other real policies that out, uh, are out there. And what we have seen is in the last 10, 20 years, it's a very unreliable process of economic growth in the world. Some, of course, have been distorted by issues like wars or pandemics, but even before, I mean, we don't have, we don't have the resiliency in growth that we, would, that we would like to see. And that puts, at different points in time, a lot of stress on fiscal and monetary policy. And at some point, that has some impact. So I think, yes, monetary policy will have to adjust, have, will have to, to evolve. We are, learning, we are learning lessons. But I think where we need to work more is to understand growth and how can we promote it in a more reliable fashion. Who doesn't, who doesn't agree with that on the panel? Does everybody? It depends what kind of growth. <laughs> and I, I, I really think that the, uh, you know, the, the, the determination of the Europeans to uh, focus and encourage uh, investment in the green yeah, growth uh, is, is critically important. If we, if we want to develop the economic potential of uh, any economy, you have I to agree. go in that direction. That's the and part of re reliability. Yeah. 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 And resilience. <laughs> yeah. If you don't. Yeah. Great. Governor Bailey and then Chair Powell. Well, I was going to observe, I mean, a point I was, I was going to comment on, on, on following what Jay and Christine were saying earlier about what we've learned from the last 10 years and then make a point on growth. I mean, one of the things we learned over that period was that the sort of the underlying interest rate, the sort of structural R star, uh, seems to have gone down for a long period of time, actually, certainly in the UK when we look at it. Um, the question is, what do we learn you know, the, these structural issues that we're facing today, what, is, what do they imply for it? I, I'm probably not in the same place as Charles Goodart because I think there are, these, these trends are so long run, particularly on the sort of population side, on longevity side, that they have quite a long way to play out even on the basis of what we know today. So I think the underlying story will, you know, will, will, will obviously move, but there's, there's a lot that's sort of built into it already. Um, just on the shorter run point on growth, I mean, I think one of the puzzles which we're certainly looking at on that, though, if, if you take that sort of underlying story of the last decade, certainly in the UK economy, is why hasn't investment been greater? Because there's, you know, there's, a, there's a gap opened up between the sort of the, the risk-free rate and the, and, and, and the, and, and the return uh, and, 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 and the, the risk-taking environment, and yet investment has been very subdued. Now, I think the, first, the, the other question we have to ask there, but but are we capturing investment there? I mean, that's something we're looking at, certainly, which is, is there just more investment of a non-traditional sort, which probably not wholly, but in part helps to explain that. But I think, you know, we, I, I see that as an important issue to understand in terms of what we want to know going forwards, because 
Yeah, there's no question that investment is, you know, Christine was saying, in, in terms of climate change, you know, is a big part of the picture going forward and how we solve some of these, these issues that we've been living with in terms of low investment and low productivity in our case as well. Chair Powell, do you think we've been over-reliant, actually, on, on monetary policy, especially as the Fed? Yes, I, I do. I would just say, um, I, I think that in economic discussion generally, there's much too much focus on, on demand management and not enough uh, on things that will make us grow at the maximum sustainable level, sustainable growth in the longer run. There's not enough focus on that. And that isn't the Fed's job. That's more the job of, again, elected governments. But yeah. I'd like to see more of that. So, so how should governments be thinking about their economic policy going forward if, <laughs> if, you know, if monetary policy is not the only game in town? You're asking me that? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm kind of out of the business of giving uh, advice to the fiscal authorities these days. So I, I would just say, I, th I think it, it, when, it, when I get asked that by an elected representative, what I say is focus on investing in people and investing in, in things that will increase the productive capacity of the economy over time. That's what I say. I, and, and in terms of, I, th I think what a central bank should do is stick to its knitting and do its job and, and leave, leave the major issues of the day to the elected representatives. President Lagarde? We have to stick to our knitting, that's for sure. But if we are asked for advice, we should give it. And I think that, you know, to the extent that fiscal and monetaries have worked hand in hand during the pandemic and, and to good effect, I think we should also reflect on how fiscal can leverage what we do and how we can facilitate it. But we're not, this is, this is no longer the same cooperation, hand-in-hand -hand, uh, work that we used to do during the pandemic. And, and I would give the same advice. Invest in people, invest in green, be targeted and focused. And, and in the medium term, you know, the fiscal space has to be, uh, has to be uh, you know, made uh, sustainable for all countries, um, certainly in the euro area. Yeah, Mr. Carstens, what's the you know, correct way of fiscal policy to, to help monitor? Well, I, 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 would, I would definitely add uh, my voice to invest in people, but I would say more, more in, in different aspects that enhance the human capabilities, very specific. Well, education is one. I think what we, what we have learned with the pandemic is that health systems are extremely important, and I think to a large extent we have underinvested invested there. Uh, the other thing is that uh, all, all digitization uh, will imp imp imply m and technolo technological advance will, imp will really uh, impose very, very dramatic uh, pressures in, in, in many countries. And I think, I think to how, how to adapt ourselves to that is very important. Climate change, as, as Christine said, is, is of the mm -hmm. essence. In many parts of the world, incorporating uh, uh, ladies, uh, females into the labor force is very important, mm -hmm. and investing more in them, I think it's also of the essence. Mm -hmm. In many parts of the world, law and order is very important. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so, I mean, there is, the, the good and bad things is that there, there is a lot to be done, but there is a wide variety of areas where we can act, and I think it can have a make a difference relatively soon. Governor Bailey. Well, I start. I mean, I mean, Jay's right. Independence goes both ways in our world, and, and we must respect that, and we do. <laughs> I think there's a common interest going back to what I was saying a few minutes ago in understanding why the trend rate of growth has has fallen, because it has, in our case, it has fallen. Um, now, I don't then, for a central bank, I'm not going to start prescribing what should be done about it, because I think in, many, in most cases that will be outside our remit. But obviously, we have a strong interest in the trend rate of growth, so understanding the trend rate of growth is, a, you know, is an important thing, and it's, it's something where we can, you know, we can collaborate in that sense, I think, perfectly happily. It's 3.27, so we only have three minutes. And I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask you just to um, close us off, um, Chair Powell, if you're speaking now to the American people to try and help them understand how long it will take for you know, monetary policy to, to go back to, to something that resembles normalcy, what would you tell them? I would say that we fully understand and appreciate uh, how the pain people are going through dealing with higher inflation, that we have the tools to address that and the resolve to use them. 
and that we are committed to and will succeed in getting inflation down to 2%. The process is likely, highly likely to involve some pain, but the worst pain would be from, from failing to address uh, this high inflation and allowing it to become persistent. President Lagarde? Dito. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Bailey? Oh, absolutely. I would just add um, one thing that is to the Jay's point and Christine's point about understanding the pain. This form of inflation is even more painful for those on low incomes because it is concentrated in the, in the essentials, in, in, in energy and food. Uh, and, and when you look at the consumption baskets of different groups of, of income groups of the population, I mean, sadly, it, it's the lowest, those in the lowest income who are most concentrated in those things. And that is, that, you know, that is very difficult and, and, and something that obviously is very sad. But we have to do everything we can. Because as Jay said, if we don't, if we don't get it back to target, the consequences are worse. Yeah. All right, it's 3.30 PM. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for a great panel. I'm going to ask the gentleman to follow me. And Madame Aguilar, you say on stage. Okay.